Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حيا رسول حيا رسول حيّر الفراخ خيّر الفراخ الله أكبر الله أكبر لا We seek God's protection against the influences of the shaitan who has been rejected and outcast. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. With God's name, our merciful benefactor and our most merciful redeemer. Ashadu an la ilaha illallahu wa akduhu la sharika allahu wa ashadu anna muhammadin abdu rasulu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amabarak. We give open testimony that there is only one God who stands alone with our partners or associates and it is he alone who deserves our worship. We further give open testimony that Muhammad, the Prophet, to whom the Quran was revealed, is God's messenger, his slave servant, and he is the seal of the prophets. We pray the prayers of peace be upon Muhammad, the Prophet, and all of those righteous servants that follow him, and all else that follows this excellent greeting. Dear believers, I greet you. Assalamu alaikum. It is my prayers always that Allah will guide my speech and my tongue, prevent me from errors and mistakes. I acknowledge before I begin that any that I make of my own and I humbly ask his forgiveness for those mistakes in advance, that he leads me to a better understanding so that I won't make them again, and I acknowledge before beginning that any good that comes from this talk is not from me. It is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we say alhamdulillah, 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 ya rabbil alameen, the praise is for God, the praise is for God, all of the praise belongs to God who is the Lord of all of the worlds and all systems of knowledge. As customary for me, I advise you as I advise myself first, that the most important thing that we will ever do in this life is to believe in God and thereafter develop our belief into faith and then develop taqwa. <laughs> to believe in God and then move from just simply believing to acting or living a life that reflects that which we say that we believe in and then developed a consciousness of God that prevents us from making the mistakes that we sometimes make in this life that bring stain on our souls prevents us from the best rewards in this life and then may keep us from the best rewards in the hereafter dear believers in the one God God says to us in this Quran Qul, say this and in case you haven't listened to any of my talks before, when God instructs you cool, he's telling you to say this to yourself first. He is instructing you to say this to other people, but we have to know that God is telling us to remind ourselves of this or say this to ourselves, come to know this particular thing. And so God says, say this. And what he asked us to say in this particular uh, ayat, <clears throat> which is in Surah 13, ayat 16, is presented to us in the form of a question. So he's actually saying, 
ask yourself this or, or ask this question to others. Who is the Lord and the sustainer of the heavens and the earth? And then say, it is indeed Allah. So then he says, say, do you then take for worship protectors other than him? such as have no power either for good or for harm to themselves. Say, are the blind equal to those who see? Or the depths of darkness equal to the light? Or do they assign to Allah partners who have created anything as he has created so that the creation seems to them similar? Say, Allah is the creator of all things. He is the one, the supreme, the irresistible. To him, Allah alone is all prayer due in truth. Any others that they call upon besides him, they don't hear them. No more than if they were to stretch forth their hands for water to reach their mouths, but it does not reach them. For the prayers of those without faith is nothing but futile wandering of the mind. Whatever beings there are in the heavens and the earth, they prostrate themselves to Allah, understanding their place in relationship to their creator with goodwill or in spite of themselves, as do their own shadows in the morning and the evening. Alif, Lam, Mim, Ra, these are the signs or the verses of the book that which has been revealed unto you from your Lord and it is the truth but most men don't believe. It is Allah who has raised the heavens without any pillars any pillars that you can see then he established himself on the throne of, throne of authority. He has subjected the sun and the moon to his law. <clears throat> each, <clears throat> each one runs its course for a term appointed. He doth regulate all affairs and explaining his signs in detail that you might believe and certainly with a certainty in the meeting with your Lord. And it is he who has spread out the earth and set thereon mountains standing firm and flowing rivers and fruits of every kind he made in pairs, two and two. He draweth the night as a veil over the day. Behold, verily, in these are signs for those who will consider. Sadaqallahu ladin and surely God speaks the truth. Dear believers in these short ayats from Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us first to remember that our prayers, our obedience, and our dedication and our service is due to Him. And thereafter, he's asking us also to remind others of the same. To remind us that whenever we rely on, call on, depend on, pray to anything other than him, our prayers, our devotion, our worship is all in vain. For the things that we turn to have no power even to help themselves. So certainly they can do nothing to help us. God reminds us that he is the Lord. 
he is the creator of the heavens and the earth that he stands alone without any partners or associates that he alone is holds the full authority and he sits on his throne by himself and when I say that God sits on his throne I'm not meaning in a physical sense that he's sitting up on a high chair in the heavens I'm merely saying that the full authority the full control of everything in this creation belongs solely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highly glorified is he and God reminds us that everything in his creation heavens and the earth all submit themselves and prostrate themselves or are devoted to him whether willingly or unwillingly and so therefore we should also be of the same nature <laughs> I think it's interesting he says that even the shadows prostrate to him in the morning and the evening so again therefore shall we we want to be mindful of our obligations to our Lord dear believers and our obligations to our own souls and remember that the struggle of the soul is the greatest jihad that we will ever undertake and we want to be conscious of our Lord at all times and so we pray that he forgive us if we forget a fall in error that he grants us protection against our shortcomings and faults that he helps us to keep our feet firmly on his straight path that he instills in us a desire to study his book as it should be studied and that he opens up the signs the ayats the verses of his book for us so that we can implement what we learn into our daily lives so we might be more successful at being the men and women he intends for us to be and thereafter so we will strive as we should be striving and he will reward us with the best from our striving in this life as well as in the hereafter and that we are saved far from the torment of the fire Amen. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. with God's name our merciful benefactor and our most merciful redeemer dear believers God says to us in Quran verily never will Allah change the condition of a people until they first change it within themselves or in their souls but when once Allah has determined that a people should be punished there can be no turning it back nor will they find besides him any who can protect them and surely Allah speaks the truth I mentioned these particular ayats in the Quran also from the same surah never will Allah change the condition of a people until they first change it themselves within their souls I mentioned this ayat in Quran as I reflect on the condition that we find ourselves in in this country in this moment that we are in right now and I understand that everyone is frustrated and angry hurt dismayed etc etc by the unjust inhumane treatment of our people and we feel the urge and the need for change and to do something that will cause change to happen so we find people out of their anger and their frustrating frustration pros, uh, protesting looting uh, going to social media uh, creating poems and songs and everything asserting themselves as important saying black lives matter in truth black my black lives do matter but all lives matter and I know that some of us will take issue with the fact that I just said what I said because in this moment it's not all lives that are being attacked 
It's the lives of our people, particularly, that are being attacked. But if I would be frank with you, black is a hue, it's not a color. White is a hue, it's not a color. So when we start talking about black lives and white lives, the reality of it is we're all, we're all human beings and all human life matters. It is very unfortunate that we're in a place where people have to say things like black lives matter. And the reality of it is, although people are saying now black lives matter, black lives have always mattered, but black lives have not seemed to matter to us. I mean, the people who are in law enforcement, I mean to people who run our government, our country, I mean to even our own selves. Black lives have not mattered. How can you say that? I say that because I look at the reality that at one time, people who we refer to as black came to this country as slaves and their lives were devalued. They, 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 were, they weren't valued. We were seen in this country as property. We weren't even looked at as actually being human being. We were property. We were the property of our slave owners. They literally brought us to this country, put us on auction blocks, and auctioned us off to the highest bidder to send us to become property of slave masters that would make us go and work their land and do their bidding, whatever it might be, and we were simply their property. And although the Constitution and our founding fathers of this nation said that all men were created equal and endowed by their creator with some, certain inalienable rights, it is unfortunate to acknowledge that we weren't really considered in that proposition that all men were created equal. Because if we were, then we never could have been simply be looked at as slaves who were the property of their owners, who were treated inhumanely at that time, and our lives were not valued as the lives of the people who brought us here. There was, there was no equality in the way that we were treated. We were not given the gift of the pursuit of happiness. We were not given the gift that the Constitution re refers to that all men have as their inalienable rights. We were not given that when we came to this country. And then as we move forward at, at one point, we were referred to as three-fifths of human beings. We were uh, three-fifths of a person. And that wasn't just to say that black people are now, we, we're evolving and we see you as three-fifths of a human now. The proposition that we were three-fifths of a human wasn't an acknowledgement that we were more human than previously thought to be. But this was because it was advantageous for the slave owners to be able to count their slaves as three-fifths of a human being because it gave them more representation in Congress. In addition to giving them more representation in Congress, it was beneficial for them for tax purposes. And it wasn't really an acknowledgement of our lives mattering or us being seen as fully human. So when forced slavery, forced to be abolished, it wasn't forced to be abolished, e even if it was forced to be abolished by people who begin to see or acknowledge the value, the human, the value of the human life of the people who were considered to be slaves, even if that was their, their reason for pushing the issue, and some would take uh, pause to, to, to accept that, but even if that was the, the case, when you force somebody to do something and they didn't do 
it from their own of their own free will, then the sentiment, the disposition in them hasn't changed. They really only did it because they had to. So what did the lawmakers do? They said, hey, you free. But they created other laws that would still put you in a position to be like slaves. So we had Jim Crow laws. And you had situations where it was, uh, it was unlawful to, to, be, to have debt. It was unlawful to do anything we did was unlawful and you could be jailed for it and you could be sentenced to do labor or you could be sentenced to fines and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm saying that the disposition in the people, this is the point I'm trying to make, the disposition in the people never changed. And laws were written and put into place that would still keep a certain group of people in a position where they would be not seen fully human or equal to their counterparts in this nation. And so what I'm saying is that the disposition in the person never changed. So although what's on the surface look different, the reality for us remained pretty much the same, that we weren't still seen as being fully human. So this idea of black lives mattering now is just not new. The, the unjust treatment, unfair treatment is not new. It has just transformed its faces over time. And it's been unjust. It, it, it has been something that needs to be addressed. But we have never really risen to the occasion to address the matter the way that it should be addressed so that things can actually change. Every now and then we get to a point where we get frustrated and angry as we are now. And what we have seen is that when people get frustrated and angry, they, be, they become uh, more, more apt to act, to do something. But what we have seen is that Every time we get to this place of being frustrated and angry, we act out in frustration and anger. And we act out in frustration and anger against the people who we believe are responsible for per perpetrating the injustice against us. The people who see us as less than human as them. And then we act out in a way that they can come back and say makes us look like savages thugs beasts animals that's what they say so when I gave my kubba last week I referred to ayahs in Quran where God says that he created us in the most excellent mode and he gave the, the, the example of the olive and the fig tree and the mount the, the mount of Sinai And, and God is, was saying to us in his ayahs <clears throat> that even like the olive, excuse me, or the fig, has potential in it to be the best fruit, one of the best fruits with all these health benefits, etc., etc. If it's in the wild state and it doesn't develop properly, then it's bitter and nasty and, and maggots and worms is disgusting. So then God tells us you were certainly created in the best of modes, but then you can be debased to be the lowest of the low. I would suggest that people who don't see the humanity of other people are folks that operate from a position of being amongst the lowest of the low. What I'm suggesting to us is that we don't allow them operating from a position of being low to make us through frustration and angry also be low. And then they turn around and point to us and say, we're lower than they're low. I hope this makes sense. What I'm saying to us is that sure, certainly we should be angry and frustrated about the realities that we face. But our frustration and anger should more 
be seen as change agents. They should be seen as God placing us in a position to finally see things that will make us want to shift. So God says in this ayat in Quran that he, had, he will never change the condition of a people until they first change what's inside of them. He's saying until something shifts in you, you won't change. Things won't change for you. Your reality will continue to be the same. I made a post a few days on Facebook and I referenced these ayats in the Quran. And I said, if I was to put it in, in layman's terms, I would say, God is telling you, until you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you just going to get what you got. And that's what we've done. We've gotten what we got. We have what we've been getting because we haven't been sick and tired enough to do things that would change our situation. And again, I understand people said, how do I then respond to this with my anger and my frustration? So they take to the streets and they protest and they tear stuff up because they mad and they angry. And they loot break into stores and run these people shouldn't be in our neighborhood anyway it's our neighborhood we're gonna break into their store and take all their stuff man because they taking advantage of us anyway but you're breaking into stores and tearing things up in your community and when it's all said and done you got to live with the aftermath of a tantrum temper tantrum and I'm sorry if that hurts, but it's a temper tantrum. It's you acting out of anger and frustration and you throw a fit. People look at you and say, look at the, look at the little animals running around throwing fits. And I told you they were dangerous. I told you that they were niggardly. I told you, this is why we treat them the way that we do. Because look at how they act. And of course, when you're angry and you're upset, you want to act. And I know that sometimes it's difficult to figure out exactly how you should actually act. Because you're angry, you, you move. But it's important to recognize that now you're moving out of emotionalism. Your emotions are in charge. Your rational mind has left the scene. And, is, and it's not actually moving you the way that you should move. Didn't God give us intelligence? Doesn't Allah tell us in the Quran that he plans, man plans, and God is the best of those that plan? Shouldn't that suggest to us that we should be planners? Not people who just react, but people who actually plan? The problem is, on the surface are racist cops. The problem on the surface are racist, period. People who hate us because we're black. But the reality of it is our problem really is systematic. It's a systematic problem that has been ongoing and existing in this country for as long as we've been part of this country really and the problem is not just a symptomatic problem it's a it's a human problem it's a problem in the souls of individuals who have lost their humanity that created a system that allows them to continue to treat people inhumane so first and foremost what needs to happen is a shift, a change has to come in the souls of the individuals who are uh, causing the injustice. But I hate to tell you this, we can't force them to change their disposition. No amount of marching, protesting, demanding, 
fighting, et cetera, et cetera, is going to cause them to change their disposition. Something has to touch their heart, touch their soul, before they will change their disposition and pivot to a place where they see all human beings as human and treat everybody the way that they should be treated. A change has to happen in them. Allah will not change their, con their condition until they change what's in themselves. And as long as they stay in a state that they're in, they're destining themselves to hell. So they have to change themselves. So what are we to do? Well, we need to change, work to change the system that they have set up. How do we change it? By protesting, marching, and demanding that you change it? No. Well, you can do that, but we've tried that several times throughout history. <laughs> and it still hasn't really changed. Malik al-Shabazz, al-Hajj Malik al-Shabazz, a.k.a. or I should say better known to most of you as Malik, excuse me, Malcolm X, once gave a speech about the ballot and the bullet. And in the speech, he said that the ballot can be more powerful than a bullet. He also suggested that if you didn't use the ballot, you're going to keep catching bullets or a foot in your neck. Most of us believe that voting don't mean nothing. Participating in the political system is pointless. In Malcolm X's speech, Malik Shabazz's speech, he made reference to the United Nations and how the African nations, though they be uh, some of them smaller, there's so many African nations that they have more votes on the UN Council. So when things come up, they have the ability to make changes and make things happen that's in their favor. But the, they can't do that if they're disunited. They can only do it when they're united. So he talked about how they organized themselves, these small African nations. And they begin to strategize on how they can advocate what was for what was in their best interest. And then they mobilize and get out and do the work that's necessary so that the changes that need to take place are being addressed. And in this speech, he suggested for us that we organize ourselves and that we strategize on how we can remove the unjust law enforcers, the law, the, the police officers that are unjust the voice of the people, the will of the people, the use of the ballot. Get these people out of here. Put the pressure on them. That we can remove the unjust laws. Get them off the books. Excuse me, the lawmakers. Get the lawmakers out. And then remove the unjust laws. We have the ability to do this. Inte using intelligence, using the same system that's being used to oppress the people, you can use the same system and remove the people who are creating the problem out of your way, completely change the laws, and put just people and just laws in place. We have that ability, but we won't do it. We would rather go and protest and get pepper sprayed in our face and rubber bullets to our heads and et cetera, et cetera. And hey, if that's your thing, Power to the people. Go and do your thing. And maybe that's what some people need to do. But I believe that a number of us should come together, begin organizing ourselves, begin strategizing with each other, and then mobilize ourselves into our communities to energize other people to exercise their right to vote go to the ballot and not this isn't this isn't the thing about just the president 
the president, that, that election is one thing and we need to participate in presidential elections. But more importantly, we need to be participating in city, municipal, and state elections. Those things get very little attention. But do you know that those things affect you more on a daily basis than anything else? The resolutions that are being passed in your city council chambers, the laws that your city and your county are passing that affect you directly, the judges that are in place, the police commissioners, et cetera, et cetera, all of these people who affect you directly, and we don't have any input, any say, any involvement. We don't even know what's going on. And then we wonder why we keep ending up in the place where we have to go out and march and protest and claim Black Lives Matter. Hey, maybe my solution is not the best solution. And maybe you believe that doing what you're doing is the solution. I applaud you for at least trying to do something. And I am grateful that your anger and your frustration in this moment has you mobilized to try and do something to make a change. I only beg that you don't allow this to be another moment in time where your anger and frustration got you up and moving. And as soon as they say, COVID is gone and, and everything is open up that you don't forget all about it and go back to life as usual. That if you are engaging yourself in the fight for justice for all people, that you continue to fight until that particular war is won. And I also strongly invite others to be leaders to be leaders in organizing, strategizing, and mobilizing, working for the benefit of us all. And lastly, I'll say this. This isn't just a Muslim thing. It's not a black thing. It's not a what y'all gonna do for us thing. This is something that affects all of us, all of our lives, everybody. It affects us all. And we all should feel a stake in this fight. Praise be to God. I've had friends from interfaith communities contacting me, asking what can we do to help. I've had people who don't who who wouldn't be considered African American or black calling me saying, uh, this is this is outrageous. What can we do to help? I've had people who are Muslim but from immigrant communities reaching out saying, Imam, what can we do to help? And then I wanted to point that out because I was recently sent a petition saying that I need to, uh, our, our Islamic center need to stand in solidarity against the immigrant Muslims and say they're not doing enough to help us in the struggle and that they're being too silent. And I wanted to point out that in my own particular situation, I don't know what the situation is across the country. Sure, there are some people who are insensitive, even folks that call themselves Muslims, insensitive, that look at African-American Muslims as less than. Sure, there are some who feel that they are superior, superior to uh, Muslims of African descent, sure there are some, although Muhammad the prophet, peace be upon him, is quoted as saying that none of that is true. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that our, our superiority lies in our uh, taqwa, in our regardfulness, consciousness, and obedience to God. That's where our superiority lies, that's what God tells us. Even though there's some that exist in my own personal experience, Allah has blessed me. God has blessed me to develop relationships, good relationships with my immigrant Muslim community. He has blessed me to develop good relationships of people of different faith and different nationalities. And as a result, they support a lot of the work that we do in this community. 
In fact, we do our project neighborly needs every year. And we have a large contingency of our immigrant Muslim brothers and sisters and our interfaith friends who come and join us in the work to help our people and our community. Many of them have said, Suleiman, you, you know your people, you know what their needs are, we just want to help. So we'll follow your lead and we'll help you. And they have been doing that for almost 20 years. So I don't intend to sign a petition against my brothers and sisters because they have been responsive. And what I will say is that if you find that they're not being responsive to you, maybe you should develop relationships with them. Maybe you should see them, let them see you work. Maybe you should let them see you contributing and not just asking for something. And maybe, inshallah, you will see a change in them. And lastly, again, if you, if you sign the petition, if you do the petition against them, you can force them, embarrass them to do something. But until a shift changes in them, they, their disposition will be the same. And I know I said lastly, but I'm about to be done. Lastly, I, I, I'm, not, I'm almost there because I don't want to leave this out. When we talk about God changing the condition of a people, not changing it until they change within themselves, that, that applies to us too. I can't leave this out. We kill each other every single day, but we only outrage when it comes by way of somebody else. We should be equally outraged that our murder rate is what it is and that we're killing each other every day. And I know you see this as two different, two different arguments, two different disputes. And I can respect where you're coming from, but from my vantage point, I am equally outraged that somebody who feels superiority to me has no value for our lives. But I'm also equally upset that we don't find value in our own lives. And until that changes, we will continue to experience the homicides in our community. And until something in us changes and something in, in the people who commit the murders changes, they will continue to do what they're doing. So I'm pointing back to God telling us that we have to change our own selves. Something has to shift. I'm glad that we have things that are causing us to take a look at ourselves and begin the process of working for change. And this is last. God says, let there arise from among you a band of people inviting to all that is good and forbidding what is wrong, evil. And God says that these are they that will be successful. I'm encouraging you all to be part of that band of people rising to the call of God to enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong so that we can make the difference in the change that causes us all to be seen and appreciated as human beings with equal rights and equal protection, etc. And once we do that, God will bless us through our efforts to be those who are successful. And we pray our Lord forgive us if we forget or fall into error, grant us protection against our shortcomings and faults. Help us keep our feet firmly on your straight path. Cause us to strive as we should strive and reward us for our striving in this life as well as in the hereafter and save us from the torment of the fire. Amen. Assalamu alaikum family. I was asked to remind you guys that even though we find ourselves in a position where we can't be at the masjid and we can't come here every Friday uh, right now because of the um, COVID-19, we still have some financial responsibilities in, in terms of bills that have to be paid. And so I was asked to remind you to still please uh, consider sending in your charity zakat or pledges, whatever the case may be, so that we can keep the bills paid. So, if you could please kindly still send in your pledges, zakat, charity, or whatever it is you normally would give, uh, we really would appreciate it. And momentarily, 
Uh, I will give you the electronic means by which to send those to us uh, if you don't already have them. All right. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Love you all. You can either send in your uh, charity zakat or donations or pledges uh, by sm snail mail to Al Haq Islamic Center, 6941 Prospect, Kansas City, Missouri, 641. Three, two, or you can cash app us, which is the most popular way of doing things these days. You can cash app us at cash app, which is dollar sign Al Hawk I C, dollar sign A L H A Q Q I C, or you can PayPal us, which you would go to paypal.me, paypal.me slash Al Hawk Islamic Center. And you can send us money via PayPal, or you can always direct deposit us through Commerce Bank. And the routing number is 101000019. Or the account, and, oh, excuse me, and the account number is 30227. That's routing number 101000019. And accounting number. I mean, account number 30227. Um, yeah, those are ways that you can send in your cash donations. They wouldn't be cash. Oh, your donations, your pledges, your zakat, or your sadaqah. And we really would greatly appreciate it so we can keep our bills paid, keep our lights on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank NPI insurance pay, you know, stuff we got to do. But thank you very much. Uh, I'm rambling. It's Hollywood. Not my fault. I'll have my regular glasses next week. Inshallah. I'm always forgetting them. But anyway, Sister Leah, you know, you know I'll be forgetting stuff. You know I'll be forgetting. All right, my bad. I love you, mama. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, be professional. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.